The second set of problems is related to the permanent economic crisis and the technological boom. We are usually being told the Schumpeterian story of economic innovation um, that the more new stuff is created using more efficient methods, the better life becomes. This is reflected in the overall rising labor productivity trend. Every time when we develop new technology, people can consume more stuff with less labor, and the workers shift from one industry to another industry. It is certainly true that we no longer have to work in coal mines, for instance, factories or rice fields to the same extent that our ancestors used to. We have seen a shift from manufacturing to service sector employment, though the level of job protection quality is much less um, in those jobs than it used to be. Even the service sector is threatened because in Japan we see experiments with robotized nurses in old people's homes. We see in education open online courses attempting to scale the, the university experience and Google experiments with self-driving cars. What this means is that the few jobs which still require human labor will simply face more competition, which keeps a check on uh, wages and also holds unions down. This might even result in slower innovation because human labor is cheaply offered to employers. A bleak future with low productivity growth, low economic growth, and a dearth of jobs awaits us in this scenario. As the innovation, however, is moving apace, we should note that today we are a much richer society than we used to be in the past. Yet for some reason, the qualitative experience of the millennial generation, people born after 1980, is rather poor. There's first a trend that the millennial generation is less likely to purchase cars than their parents. And the second trend is that millennials are more likely to live with their parents than their own parents did. Companies are crying alarm, and rightfully so. It was the pinnacle of consumerist capitalism that young people should be convinced to buy cars and houses, because that is an indicator of the economic advancement that has happened in society. What is the point of businesses to make investments and to hire people if the consumers of the future are unwilling to loosen their wallets? Except that the millennial generation does not have much money left in their wallets. By creating a new social risk category of young people with irregular and insecure employment experiences, it is not surprising that young people simply lack the income to consume. I'm certainly not a supporter of hedonistic consumption, but within the logic of growth-driven capitalist economy, it is impossible to not demand growth and still maintain social equilibrium. The winners of innovation and technological advancement are no doubt the global oligarchy. By that, I mean a handful of people who use copyright, patents, and legal systems to protect their private claims on this huge wealth generation, which is really the biggest wealth transfer in our history when we think of the Bill Gates in the world. Apologists of capitalism may still seek to defend Bill Gates and people in his tribe because He's partially responsible for the innovation. I cannot take this argument very seriously because it is the joint creation of the workers and the entrepreneurial bosses which produces innovation and the mid-level software engineers and the workers in the assembly lines today are certainly not uh, paid off their fair share. Before one goes on to praise the entrepreneurs like Louis XIV during his absolutist heyday, one should consider carefully the simple question whether it is possible for one person to earn billions and billions of dollars out of his own volition without the workers and consumers that have created the demand and supply of the products to begin with. But let me admit that the Bill Gates of the world are not the worst creatures of contemporary capitalism. Even worse are the financiers, the Warren Buffetts and George Soros of the world. In the ideal economic system, financiers only have the role to funnel the savings of some people and you know, push it to productive investments uh, for another group of people. What is really happening today is that productive investments are becoming decreasingly, decreasingly less important areas for financial investments. The vast majority of financial investments should rather be called financial speculation 
where assets are bought and sold in the expectation that its value will increase at some point. They have the fantastic effect of redistributing vast sums of money into the pockets of these financiers, whether they're managing the private equity or the hedge funds. What is worse is that the central banks have aided the speculative drive by lowering the interest rate to near zero and supplying them with endless amounts of liquidity. Needless to say, people who don't own major financial shares and companies and workers who fell victim, victim to efficiency-enhancing job cuts and wage cuts, of course, do not benefit much from the financial sector boom. Income inequality necessarily increases. As Jim Galbraith writes, quote, for countries very high in the world income scale, as you get richer, you get more unequal. And that is because your economies shift to it being dominated by finance, by banks, by technology firms, and in some cases, by oil and energy firms. And when you have growth, these industries are already the top. So they get richer relatively and the inequality increases. Even apologists of entrepreneurial capitalism can no longer deny that contemporary capitalism and the contemporary growth of wealth and income inequality is largely driven by a rapacious finance-driven growth model. The increase of private, public, and corporate debt, which creates no additional value in the economy, but fixes debt peonage and slavery for the workers, consumers, and taxpayers of the world. And by the way, financiers and corporations who shelter their income in tax havens are not even the primary taxpayers here. Now, James Galbraith claims that technology is not the main cause of rising inequality, while I think that there are multiple reasons why inequality is increasing, and technology is just one of them. Financial capitalism is just another cause. But let me go back to the main question that I posed um, in this um, talk. What is the effect of rising inequality, precarious employment, and debt-based uh, low economic growth on democracy? Well, we should step back for a second again. For one, we can see that the macroeconomic policy tools for government is not as far-reaching as it used to be. We no longer have any cross-national capital controls. The lack of national regulation allows wealthy players to pick their favorite destinations to park the money untaxed. If there were such a thing as global democracy, some of these assets would be taxed and redistributed, so everyone benefits. But where is the global government today? The increasing wealth of the global oligarchy also means that their means to control the political system are also enhanced. Pericles, the leader of Athenian democracy, said in his funeral speech that democracy means to the administration of the state is in the hands of the whole of the people and not the few. But if income inequality is rapidly increasing within countries, then it is rather untenable to maintain a democratic system. Even Aristotle realized that and said that in order to maintain a stable political system, any society needs a strong middle class, which quite frankly is disappearing. What the ancient Greeks are telling us is that growing wealth and income inequality weakens democratic decision making. The poor masses are not influential in politics and have to fend for the immediate survival. The collapsing middle class cannot form a counterbalance to the influence peddling of the rich. And finally, the rich become more suspicious of the envious masses and they draw up the barriers to protect their wealth. They buy up the political system. Is it any surprise that today you barely have any politician who wants to openly increase taxes on the rich, the so-called job creators? The unresponsiveness of a political leaders to the needs of working middle class people is clearly revealed in the, handling, the poor handling of the economic crisis. But first, let's step back for a minute and look at the economic crisis. We know, first of all, that there's a secular development to an economic stagnation, in brief, secular stagnation, which is based um, on the slowdown in population growth. The creation of credit bubbles in the housing sector, the slowdown of overall productivity growth, and growing um, inequality as the wealthy have a higher tendency to save than the poor. The tendency towards secular stagnation is frantically counteracted by higher inflation, the rise in state and private debt, and central bank purchases of bank liabilities, each time followed by ever-decreasing rates of satisfaction. There's less of an impact. Logically, we should realize how foolish the hope of endless compound economic growth is. 
it is easier for a very small economy to grow than for a very large economy. Let me just use a simple example as illustration. Imagine a very uneducated society that begins to build schools to raise the human capital of the citizenry so they can use those skills in the labor market at a higher level of productivity so the economy grows. And take another society with a fully developed educational system where additional years of schooling yield only very marginal benefits in terms of economic productivity growth. Now that we have established secular stagnation as a reality of life, we should briefly reflect on what government policymakers have done to respond to the crisis. Bank bailouts and economic austerity are the only permissible medicine today, which is more acutely the case in Europe than in the U.S., costing more jobs and livelihoods. Greece is perhaps the most dramatic example of the mishandling of the economic crisis. So one example is um, the Greek pensioner, Georges Chosifotiadis. He tried to withdraw money from his pension check and was denied each time. He decided to block the entrance to the bank and stop in despair. The police, which ironically protects private capital rather than pension rights, just dragged him out. But his fate is not the only fate. We have to realize that in the neoliberal present, any social rights that the working class has fought for over the last decades are put into question. The dr dramatic deterioration of fiscal balances in Greece following the spike of government bond interest rates resulted in elevated rates, or should we say punitive rates, of taxation for the working class. Cutbacks in health, pensions, education, and social spending, and finally, a flight of the capital of the rich, who can escape the taxman at any time. And this is, in fact, what happened in Greece and other places. Our austerity is sold to the people as a panacea to restore international competitiveness. But after the X time, hundreds of time, of implementing it, failing to restore economic growth and lowering public debt, as they say they would, we know that there's a quite different agenda in the minds of the policymakers, which is simply the redistribution of wealth from the middle class to the rich. The fact that all centrist political parties accept the banker narrative of the crisis and the prescription means that people are becoming more and more frustrated from the regular political democratic process. And in the final part of the video, we'll talk about, um, you know, final aspects of what contributes to the crisis of democracy.